Good afternoon, everyone. This is the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee in the Vermont State House, and it is the 2nd of February, 2022, and it is the afternoon. And we are talking today about food security, which is one of those topics that I'm really interested in, mostly because I love to eat, but um, I think we all do. Um, so we're going to kick it off today. We have several witnesses, and we're going to kick it off with Ellen Kaler. So Ellen, you want to you want to start things? Sure. So for the record, Ellen Kaler, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and we administer Vermont Farm to Plate. Uh, so I just thought I would start off briefly by just providing a little context for why this conversation is is getting underway and. Uh, encourage you to keep the conversation going. There are a few other individuals that I think it would be helpful for you all to hear from. Uh, and then I want to, I'll come back after Becca. Becca will walk through a few pieces of a, of a new project that is moving forward within Vermont Farm to Plate that's coming directly out of the strategic plan that we gave you last year. And then Helen and Mary Kate will be speaking uh, from the Bi-State Primary Care Association about why they're involved in this project and what they're seeing on the ground from their perspective. And then uh, I'll circle back at the end and uh, try to put a bow on it all, so to speak. Um, we do have a financial ask. And so I wanna be able to uh, have a little time at the end to sort of just put that out on the table for consideration as well related to this project, okay? So, so the so food food the notion of food security and the notion of food insecurity, right? Food insecurity oh, is is like is is basically uh, all different types of aspects that relate to hunger, and not feeling that you have you know where the next meal is going to come from, whether it's your next meal or within the week, of just not having a sense of like being, being confident that you're gonna have enough food for yourself, for your family. And as we saw during COVID, uh, we saw a major increase in the number of Vermonters experiencing food insecurity. And there were a number of incredible community responses to that from neighbor helping neighbor to Vermont Everyone Eats to community pop-up uh, meals all sorts of things, uh, uh, the way the Vermont Food Bank and, and Hunger Free Vermont mobilized their networks uh, to, to provide more food. The, the family food box at the agency worked with uh, the, the Emergency Operations Center to be able to get distri dist distributing food to Vermonters in need, like unprecedented mobilization that happened during that time in response. And it's still going on. You know, Vermont Everyone Eats still has funding through the end of March, for instance, thankfully. So you may recall that last year during your session, we talked about th this notion of emergency preparedness and what became uh, evident during the height of the pandemic was that in the state emergency operations center, the Agency of Agriculture staff were not mobilized the way that other agencies were mobilized. And that got us to thinking about, well, why not? What, this is, there was so much food related issues that were coming up because of this pandemic. Why was the agency not mobilized? They, because they care and they know what to do, they, they started uh, getting involved. Um, not because they were told to or were expected to, but because they knew that was the right thing to do. So as we took a look at the starting to learn more about the framework of around that happens during emergencies, there is this document called the, uh, the Agency of Agriculture has an annex to the state emergency management plan that provides a... Um, so it indicates when they get mobilized and under what circumstances. And you all in, I believe the housekeeping bill last year requested that the agency look at their annex and consider changes to it that would uh, bring it, would, would enable uh, them to be mobilized at, at future times that made sense related, that had somehow had food involved. 
So I would really highly recommend that you, if you haven't already, to have uh, Diane Bofeld and, and Abby, you know, folks from the agency in, because you all received a report on January 15th from them about what it is that they're recommending uh, and what they're changing uh, for uh, in terms of their annex. So, so that's one, one piece of this is that during times of emergencies, like the pandemic, like Tropical Storm Irene, other kinds of natural disasters or un unplanned for events, there are times when we need to be able to mobilize our food supply in Vermont in order to feed Vermonters. And so a lot of the conversation that's been happening these days in the Vermont Everyone Eats Task Force has been around, what have we learned in this process of the pandemic? What has worked well in terms of mobilizing food? Where did we fall short? What do we wish we had been prepared better for had we known what was coming at us? What can we learn and put in place for next time? So during the farm to play strategic planning process, we were aware of all this, right? We were building the plan during the pandemic. So we were watching what was going on with food insecurity rising, the work that Meredith Niles was doing at UVM with surveying Vermonters to see how food insecure they were, look, watching those, the trend lines. We were, we were thinking about how do we strengthen Vermont agriculture and Vermont food production overall. And all of these conversations were happening at the same time. And so what, we've, what we ended up putting into the, the strategic plan was, what part of what informed it was this notion of, we wanna <laughs> strengthen Vermont's food system and, and expand our production so that we're, the, all Vermonters are consuming more locally produced food, right? We set a target of to get to 25% local food consumption by 2030. So we wanna, we wanna, we, we're gonna be implementing strategies and taking action in ways and, and hopefully making investments in those things that will strengthen our food system. But it's not just at when there's an emergency, it's also, at times when there's not an emergency. And so in the process of having these conversations with the emergency management folks, of folks that are running the emergency operations center and such, what we all started to come to, to realize is that if we wanna have more local food available during times of emergencies, we also have to be planning for and making and manifesting greater food production in non-emergency times, because otherwise when we need it, it's not gonna be there. So these two things, these, this, these two um, really married notions of strengthening our local food system, the distribution of it, the production of food, movement of food around, needs to be in more organized and in better in place during emergencies. Right? So there's this sort of after, after action planning that the Emergency Operations Center and the Everyone Eats Task Force are doing. Like, okay, how do, we, how do we be better prepared for the next crisis we have to work on? But then what are all the things we need to be doing in non-emergency times to strengthen the food system? And that's where the strategic plan comes in. And you may or may not recall, uh, and Becca's gonna uh, shine a light on this, is that one of the, there was a food security brief in the plan. So you can look that up and read that. It's a couple of pager, Becca wrote it, was the lead author on it with a number of good people. And one of the priority strategies, right? There's 34 priority strategies. One of them is to create a food security plan in Vermont that addresses these fundamental uh, needs of being, of, of being prepared when there are emergencies, but then also strengthening all of our systems so that we get to a place in Vermont where there's no one who's food insecure. Like nobody is going hungry. Nobody's worrying about where their next meal is gonna be coming from. That's the ultimate state we wanna get to. And so in the strategic plan, we talked about the need to actually develop 
a, a document, a, a roadmap, an action plan specific to food security building in the state. Does that make sense? You're with me on that? Yes. <clears throat> and I've got the Bible here with me. Okay. So you found you found the, the, the page that that is on. So um, so what I had um, suggested to Representative Partridge was to bring in a number of voices who are all have a, a piece of the puzzle, so to speak, of wanting to create this, this food security plan for the state. Because it's, it, is a, it is a concept that folks at the Food Bank, at Hunger Free Vermont, at the Agency of Human Services, a lot of folks that have been doing this work for a really long time are very excited about because it's the kind of thing that we all wish we had been able to do. And we're using this coming out of the pandemic period where, where the whole, the, 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 the sheer volume of people that that have been food insecure during this pandemic is so front and center for us. We know this, we, we, we know people that this has impacted who for the first time in their lives even have been food insecure. So this is the perfect opportunity to really address these fundamental challenges and these fundamental structural issues of why Vermonters are food insecure in the first place. And when we have emergencies that we don't have, we don't have a worsening situation when it comes to that because we have, a, we have more control over our own food supply and because we have the systems in place to, to uh, be sure that we're really taking care of one another. So that's the setup. Uh, I'll hand it over to, to, to Becca and then um, she'll <clears throat> hand it off to Helen and, and Mary Kate. Great, welcome Becca, thank you. And thank you, Ellen. Do screen. Okay, here I am. I couldn't even unmute myself. Thank you, Ellen, for that introduction. I'm going to go um, over a bit of um, what Ellen was reviewing, but in a, talking about it from a, how the plan is going to look and be developed. So wish me luck here. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, are you all seeing my slideshow? Yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> It's truly incredible. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with all of you today. As, um, as you know, my name is Becca Warren and I'm the farm to plate food security project manager now at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. And as Ellen has reviewed, a year ago we released the new Vermont Agriculture and Food System Strategic Plan, which has 34 strategic priorities. Um, related to sustainable economic development, environmental sustainability, and healthy local food for all Vermonters. And the strategic priority that um, I'm leading folks to tackle now and that we're discussing today is the, this strategy, strategy 24, to develop a Vermont for food security plan centered around a strong local food system and inspired by community responses to food insecurity and disruptive events. And food security will exist or it does exist when all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And the four pillars of food security are availability, access, utilization, and stability. And I like thinking about the pillars because it helps me understand how in Vermont we have a role to play in a lot of these pillars, including availability and uh, access. And as we know, food security is not a given for almost a third of Vermont households. And that reference that um, Ellen made to Meredith Niles' uh, UVM research She's been leading multiple studies on food insecurity in Vermont during the pandemic and has confirmed that food insecurity has risen in Vermont and that it impacts Vermonters inequitably, which is an important focus of our work um, in the food security plan creation. Now, household food insecurity we know is a result of social and economic factors that are often beyond the control of individual households and eliminating it will require a systemic approach, a system level approach to ending poverty and 
resolving other barriers to healthy food in Vermont. So the premise, as Ellen said, of our food security planning is that coordinated statewide action is needed to ensure food security across the state, both in times of crisis, as we've been experiencing now, but also in times of calm. And because another premise that we hold in the planning is that because of our strong agricultural sector, Vermont does have a unique opportunity to ensure that food remains available, remains accessible, remains stable, and that all our residents are food secure. We believe that it is possible to improve food security. And as the, you know, the COVID pandemic has un really unfortunately exposed the fragility and the inequity of the globalized food system and caused increased hunger in Vermont. However, it's also shown what Vermont can do. We haven't been cowed by this pandemic. This is you know, an incomplete list of the federal and state and community programs that have been supporting Vermonters to get food on the table in the past two years. So two things to highlight here that relate to the timeliness of the food security planning is that this list, we know we're looking at federal nutrition programs, innovative community-based responses, like be, you know, Vermont Everyone Eats and all the hubs that are participating, the State Emergency Operations Center, which is doing incredible work, the charitable and emergency food assistance programs. It looks like a list of separate programs, but we know that in fact, this is a list of efforts that in Vermont involves deep collaboration between these state agency staff, between all the businesses, the nonprofits, the community volunteers. And the second piece that I believe is vital to our state is that Vermont farms are participating in all of these projects and collaborating deeply with the people who are running them. And that just has an incredible um, promise to me of what we can do as we look forward. So I'm just gonna come back to this food security plan priority strategy, because it calls out that when we're talking about food security, we want the system to deeply integrate Vermont agriculture. And that we also recognize that climate change is transforming our food system and needs to be planned for. And which is why the state climate action plan contains the same priority strategy. We need the food system that ensures food security today so that Vermonters no longer are hungry, they're no longer experiencing poor health outcomes related to poor diet, they're not choosing between food and heat. And as Ellen said, that the secure food system we create for today will then support us in emergencies. So the food security plan will be centered around the thriving food system, inspired by community-based responses to food insecurity and disruptive events. We are going to involve um, food insecure individuals as well as farmers in the plan and look into questions that include affordable housing, healthcare, transportation, the siting of retail grocery stores, how food is distributed, and ensuring the con continued production of food in Vermont. All of these pieces that we know are incredibly important to food access, to food availability. Um, we're going to work then to determine what state and regional policies and procedures and plans can ensure that the Vermont food supply is sufficient, sufficient to withstand national and global supply chain disruptions. Um, <clears throat> and so we've begun a two-year effort, which is held within the Farm to Plate Network, but already involves many statewide partners who are typically considered outside the food system and will soon involve many individuals and groups who are deeply impacted by these gaps that we have in our food system. Um, and as you know, the network, the farm to plate network works in a team approach. And um, what we're now calling the strategy teams because the, um, the group is working on the food security strategy. So the strategy team for food security already involves over 80 individuals who are representing themselves and diverse types of professions. It's frankly a little overwhelming when I start having um, meetings and we'll sort of open up registration and I'll think maybe 25 people will come and then we'll have 60 folks in the group. There's a lot of excitement surrounding this project. People are, I think even as we are eager to have for the pandemic to come to an end, um, part of that eagerness is getting to the point where we can take what we have learned in the past two years, build on the collaborations that have emerged and, and plan um, for the future. And so the planning process itself involves um, three basic components. So one is hearing for Vermonters. 
um, involving a huge range of Vermont residents in the process of designing the plan and a really robust public engagement process to get input and the expertise of those who have lived experience with food insecurity and with producing food and trying to get it to those who most need it. There will be a research component. There's a lot of existing research about the causes uh, and mm, enhancers of food insecurity, um, but the creation of the plan and the planning process will allow us to aggregate this information, to gather everything that's already known together, and then fill in important information gaps by undertaking additional research as needed. And then we will be creating a food security plan document, which might be more accurately phrased the way we're picturing it as a roadmap to food security in Vermont that is accessible to Vermonters around the state who are in different roles, whether they're a food shelf volunteer or um, a state employee. And I just wanna re-emphasize here that the central part of the process is to involve Vermont residents who are inequitably impacted by gaps in the food system. Vermonters who are at risk, who are experiencing food insecurity, who are inequitably impacted, they know best what their barriers and needs are. And a plan to resolve food insecurity is going to be most successful with their voices and their expertise. So for that reason, we've included robust stipends in our budget for meaningful participation um, of these people who have lived experience, whether that's within the public engagement process or within the governance of the planning process. I'm really excited about that aspect of what we're planning. And so when we have a plan in hand, what will be in it? You know, like I said, it will be probably more of an action plan or a roadmap rather than a strategic plan like the Bible representative Partridge is holding that it might be designed to sit on a desk and is for one particular audience. This would be for people across the state, as I said, and it will document the wide array of food security organizations and initiatives across statewide to enable people to make connections and to not duplicate efforts. It'll give an overview of the current status of each of the elements of food security in the state and what the barriers to improving them are, and an analysis of how these elements will be affected by climate change and what we're anticipating from what we know um, about the climate science. It will recommend actions for improving food security that have been prioritized in the public engagement process. So really publicly vetted, Vermont approved responses to food security. What's gonna be most successful for people who are living with the issue? And then it'll be accessible for many different kinds of Vermonters to figure out what their role is. Um, and our focus as we think forward to creating the document is thinking about how will it most be present, how can it be presented to lead to action in the most effective way? That's a big focus of the project and the team. And I just wanna be, share a personal emotion about this, which is that I find this process incredibly exciting. Um, the, those involved in the strategy team clearly believe we have a unique opportunity right now to solve the food security <laughs> dilemmas and to once again show what Vermont can do. Um, and the energy is really, is really palpable. So that concludes my presentation. And thank you so much for this time. Well, thank you, Becca. We really appreciate that. And who would you like to have up next, Helen? Helen has yeah, so, so, well, so this planning process brings together many streams of funding sources to pull it together. And very early on, uh, Helen, who's been part of Farm to Plate since the beginning in many different ways and in many different groups, um, got very excited about this particular project of, of building a food security plan for Vermont. And so um, I thought it'd be helpful for Helen and her colleague, Mary Kate, to share a little bit about um, how they're thinking about it, how it, how, like, why does this matter to their organization and, and what's their involvement in this project? Great, thank you, Alan. 
Uh, so I see so, so you have Ellen and Helen. <laughs> uh, I'm Helen Laban. I, I am the special projects manager for healthcare and food access at Bi State Primary Care Association. And as Ellen mentioned, uh, my colleague Mary Kate Molman is sort of here through the wonders of technology. She is partially here, partially addressing healthcare bills in another committee. So we can flag her if we need specific healthcare input. She is the uh, Vermont State Public Policy Director for Bi State Primary Care. <laughs> And I, what I'm going to do here, I'll give you a quick background on what my program is working on. Then I'll hit on some of the key points of intersection with what Ellen uh, was just discussing from our perspective um, in healthcare. And I recognize that the question of food, food access, and the future of healthcare in Vermont is also itself a very large uh, topic. So, you know, given that we have time and I'm here. If you have any questions on that, I'm also happy to, happy to entertain those, but I will focus on that element of our work that intersects with what um, Farm to Plate is working on. And I should add, we are one of the funders of, of some of their strategic planning work. So my program is a federally funded program. It's a strategic planning program. It began part-time in 2020, um, became full-time over this past uh, summer. I was previously the Vermont State Public Policy Director for Bi State Primary Care. Um, but the idea behind the food access and healthcare programs that I'm working on is to look at that intersection of food, food and food access with the broad rural healthcare systems in Vermont, including looking at programs that are happening in other states and in other collaboratives and also in national policy making and how they might play out on the ground here in Vermont, given our structure. Um, I should say for, for this particular audience, we, we are not the same as healthcare without harm. We don't look at the sourcing for the food services within a healthcare setting, but we work closely with those groups. We represent all practice types, um, including those who do not have <laughs> food services uh, within their program. So that's just one distinction to make that we're in a different lane than that. Bi State Primary Care Association, which is the home for this program, represents the federally qualified health centers in Vermont, as well as the free and referral clinics, um, the AHECs, and the Planned Parenthood clinics of Northern New England. Every state has a primary care association as part of the federal programming to support primary care access to everyone, regardless of where they live, their insurance status, or their ability to pay. And that really subsidizes not only access um, for folks regardless of financial stability, but also ensures that there's comprehensive quality primary and preventive care services everywhere in the country. And so that's what our program grew out of. Federally qualified health centers um, are, well, famous in a very small circle of policy geeks for being the, the first to write food prescriptions in the modern era of, of health care down in Missouri in the 1960s. Um, but my program does represent all healthcare practices, not only the bi-state practices. Um, so when we work on the intersection of uh, food access and healthcare, we think of it as kind of three different buckets that are overlapping within the system. So the first is going to be that foundational food security that you were just um, hearing about from Ellen Wright. So when you see that in a healthcare practice context, some of the ways that shows up would be screening patients for food insecurity and referring them to community services for food access. Uh, sometimes you see healthcare practices standing up food boxes or emergency pantries um, at the clinic so that folks who, who need food tonight um, have food available there. You also see it in the national conversation around how we're defining food security and the role that nutrition security has in that. Um, we see uh, folks from healthcare both having a strong opinion about that. They have lots of opinions about things like the impact of corn subsidy systems on type two diabetes prevalence in America, right? So there's a policy opinion and also an expertise that goes into crafting our approach to food security. We also look at community health programs and general prevention. You're probably familiar, there's a lot of work there um, in Vermont with lots of well-known programs. Um, and this is looking at the idea that we're encouraging people to have healthier eating patterns, more more produce, more home-cooked meals. Uh, you see a lot of education programs there. Uh, something like CSA and healthcare, the healthcare shares are often in that mode of, of that uh, upstream prevention work. And you also see because of that importance of upstream prevention to healthcare, things like you know, payers giving grants to farm to school or, or other prevention grants that are going into local food systems and also um, healthy eating systems. 
And then we move through there to the idea of individual healthcare. So now you're going from generally healthy eating patterns for everyone to here's an individual patient with individual health concerns, health goals, clinical indicators. What are we going to do for this patient to integrate diet and healthy food into their care and treatment? Um, and that might be often it comes up in the idea of managing chronic conditions or in combination with medication, for example, to bring down cholesterol levels, but it also appears in more acute instances, for example, transitioning out of an inpatient hospital stay back to home, what's going to facilitate that transition, or after a new diagnosis as you help a patient adjust to new eating patterns. So that's, again, tied to the individual and their particular health goals and health outcomes. And, and a common example of this from the food side is if you hear of medically tailored meals, that's a treatment-focused individual prevention that, that is growing um, in its prevalence uh, nationwide. And also that individual healthcare bucket is often where reimbursement conversations live. So sh should food be a component of covered health services? Generally, it gets invoked in that individual healthcare realm, whereas um, the USDA programs are more on the food nutrition when you come into, when you move out of specialized grants and into um, standing coverage in, in national policy. So those are the areas that we look at. Um, looking at the pandemic and just some examples of some lessons learned, obviously many impacts across, across healthcare. <laughs> um, but in the, in the area of food security, I think that the first thing that folks working on food and healthcare will tell you is that it really highlighted where we are and it's not a good place in terms of diet related health conditions, the far reaching impacts of those diet related health conditions, the unequal distribution of who suffers from those conditions. Um, the NIH published the studies that found that in 2020 COVID-19 hospitalizations, 66% of them could be attributed to diet related comorbidities. Um, the government accountability office recently came out with a report um, that basically took the federal government to task on not having a coherent strategy for dealing with this uh, issue in America and the, and the fallout that we saw with the pandemic, but also in the rising costs of healthcare and the uh, percentage of that, which by some calculations, the majority percentage of the cost of healthcare being linked back to uh, diet, diet related issues. Um, and, and just a general takeaway from that, I mean, many of us have, have long since accepted that food and diet has, has a lot to do with your health outcomes, but something that's really key for me in looking at this and our work that we're doing in the Food Access and Healthcare Consortium is just that it underscored a lot of our programming is in prevention, general prevention, upstream um, work. Overall, that's what we want in healthcare. We want to get to um, root causes, to systems change, to moving upstream, to preserve wellness, and to invest in prevention. That being said, most Americans are no longer at the prevention stage. They now are in the treatment stage for a diet-related condition. So that, that's, a, that's a significant distinction when you come to how you set up your healthcare systems to, to handle this, I don't know, twin pandemics is used so much for so many different things, but it really is uh, two epidemics that are, that, that are happening right now. Some specific examples that we saw on the ground in terms of um, disruptions during the pandemic, the response and what that might mean for the future. I'll just give you three um, highlights from that connect to different areas of our work. The first was there was a disruption to the standard systems that healthcare practices were using for screening and referral to services. These tend to be tied to um, wellness visits, pediatric visits, uh, check-in visits, uh, patients coming into the office or now remotely into the office. Um, that kind of passive screening works well in general, but not when you have your number of patients coming in, you know, going off a cliff for preventive care <laughs> while the rates of food insecurity are rising, right? Now, healthcare practices also had plenty of other things that they were dealing with at that time. So perhaps one could say they shouldn't be the leaders in, in connecting folks, but they were still engaged in, in connecting patients with those community resources. And importantly, looking forward, in response to the pandemic, there was a lot of work on proactive outreach to patients, right? You need to engage them if they're at high risk for COVID to keep them informed. You need to have systems to engage with patients that don't rely on physically being in the office. Uh, you need to uh, 
do outreach to make sure that people know how telehealth works, right? So there was a sea change in that proactive outreach. And now we're looking as at how that can be tied into um, ongoing concerns like access to uh, food resources, like enrollment in three squares. And in fact, we're currently planning a pilot to, to do exactly that, to, to learn from those lessons and utilize these new systems to be more proactive in the outreach to, to connect with patients and um, place this food access um, and these uh, programs to help with food access into the context of health. Another thing that happened was, of course, the burden of keeping up with all the information, right? There was, um, it's always difficult in general, uh, but there was lots of new information, lots of changing information everywhere, including for food access programs, um, including hours that they were open, new programs standing up, how do you access those programs. At healthcare practices, there are care coordinators who are there to make those referrals and help patients navigate those mm -hmm. community services. So we worked with our partners across the state during the pandemic to look at where our practices were accessing information on, on, on what their options were for food access, how to streamline where they were getting their information so that they could um, have the most up-to-date information and get it to patients. This, but this challenge of managing all these different streams of information when working with patients in a care coordinating capacity, uh, from the healthcare perspective, that's gonna be an ongoing challenge at some level because they're not only looking at food access, we're asking more and more of our healthcare practices to be navigators of social services, to manage social determinants of health, to consult patients on everything from financial planning to housing, to food access to transportation and connect them with local services. There are only so many brain cells available to, if each, if each, if each of those elements has a hundred different possible programs to go with it, it's going to be very difficult for a care coordinator to, to work with patients on that. And there's an, an increasing movement within healthcare to do these broad screening of social needs and deal with a broad range of social needs. So an ongoing challenge is going to be, how do we make that information flow manageable, actionable, and useful to the patients? So that's something else that we'll be looking at um, coming out of the pandemic. And then the last, and, and possibly the most important one I'm gonna spend a, a little bit of time on this was an emergency. COVID-19 was and is an emergency. And it's an emergency that's going on for a really long time. <laughs> so it's from a health perspective, what you do to get someone food if, if you're supplying a diet for a couple of weeks, maybe a month of disruption and multiple years of disruption, those are, those are two different things. One is really defining your eating pattern. And if you're trying to manage a chronic condition, a diet related condition, which we said at the outset, most people are, then you've got questions to ask about, about how you're gonna do this in an emergency response situation. And, and I just wanna highlight and that, that there are programs who do this, and I'm gonna choose one because they are great. Um, and also I, I just completed a podcast episode going into some details. Um, about the Meals on Wheels program and the area agencies on aging who really nationally have kind of set a standard for integrating food access and nutrition security and um, health related concerns and healthcare integration uh, in their programming. So some elements of those programs that really help in a situation like we're in right now. So about 80% of Vermonters who participate in Meals on Wheels are using that food to manage a uh, health condition that they have. And that's true nationally as well. That's health holds it statewide and nationally. The Meals on Wheels program, the guidelines for it are designed to facilitate that. So there are nutritionists on staff. Uh, you can modify the food to different health needs um, and they follow different guidelines for, for responding to those health conditions. Um, they also provide some amount of care coordination services and coordination with the primary care provider around nutritional needs and managing health conditions. They provide a, um, I should say, they also provide one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling as, as needed. They also provide a minimum amount of food. So generally speaking, when you're using food and food insecurity responses to, to manage a health condition, if it's a medically tailored meal, you wanna be providing two thirds of what the household needs for the week. 
Um, for Meals on Wheels, not all the way up at that medically tailored level, it's one third minimum um, of the food needed for a week. So you want to have, you need to have a certain volume of food to influence and support the healthy diet. And then another key issue that we look at is reducing additional barriers to access, especially if you are going to be working with clients who have a health condition that might limit mobility or, or make um, other access uh, difficult. So the transportation to home delivered, as well as having congregate settings as an option uh, is really important in that context. And those are all things that the Meals on Wheels programs provide. Now, that program has been around for 50 years, and it's easy to start to take something for granted after it's been around for 50 years, right? So when the pandemic comes, there is an instant impact on those programs. The clients they're serving are in the highest risk categories. The meal sites where people are coming together to eat get shut down, and now you've got more folks who, who need food delivered at home. Because there is that concern about going out into gathering areas and their, and public transportation and all these other constraints, that's true not only for where they get the Meals on Wheels food, but the, but the other part of their diet, right? So there's increased food insecurity need um, for Vermonters enrolled in these programs for, for many of them. And additionally, <laughs> Meals on Wheels is largely volunteer run and their volunteers are also in the high risk category. So now they've got a confluence of factors really reducing their capacity um, to serve that key role in nutrition services. Now I should say, they, I'm sure they would be happy to tell you how admirably they responded to that, to, to Ellen and Becca's opening points that we really rallied and, and approached this initiative. But you know, sometimes it takes something like that to make you realize what will happen if some of these services go away and, and how can we strengthen them, them outside of pandemic times so that they can support us during the pen, during an emergency, during a prolonged emergency um, and serve these health needs. So those are some three examples of, of different ways that we saw disruption and responded and are using that to think about what we're going to do next. And then the last point uh, to, to the planning and um, by state investing in, in some of this planning work you know, for for us, it's, it's a it's there's a pragmatism here, right? We just had a major disruption, lots of federal waivers, lots of changes to programs. It's gone on long enough that there that some people are still deep into crisis mode. I can't see five minutes in front of me. Other programs have are able to take some strategic distance and start to think through, well, what waivers do we want to keep in place? What don't we want to keep in place? What have we learned to make changes and how can we exit this in a way that, that sets us up to um, invest in systems and, and learn from these lessons while they're still fresh and with us? So we're trying to hit that timing just right with those organizations that do have capacity for the strategic planning, for engaging people in the strategic planning, because now is the window uh, to reorganize for this change. And, and in the world of healthcare, change comes incrementally, not as slowly as federal dairy pricing systems. We have changed since the 1930s, but it comes very incrementally. And you want that, right? You want your healthcare system to be somewhat conservative <laughs> with people's health and lives. Um, so if there's a opportunity to do the planning, do the studies, do the research that we're gonna need to bolster our argument for sustained change in the future, we'll certainly take it. Um, and are excited to be able to work with uh, the Sustainable Jobs Fund and Farm to Plate on this opportunity. So that was a whirlwind tour of one little piece of food access and healthcare in Vermont. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions or provide any more information. Oh, fantastic, Helen. That was, that was, it was a whirlwind tour and thank you so much. That was great, very interesting. Um, committee, do you have any questions for Helen at this point? Tom. <clears throat> A question, I don't know, for either Alan or Helen, I don't know, but uh, uh, in terms of emergency preparedness and the future, I know you're still working on the strategy, but do you, do you envision uh, stockpiled foods, uh, that kind of thing in, in public buildings? How do you see this uh, working out, this, this um, emergency, emergency preparedness uh, and, and feeding populations that are just out of food because of an emergency? That sounds like an Ellen question more than a Helen question. 
Well, I can also uh -huh. tackle this a little bit, unless Ellen, you have a, no, you go have a response. No, go um, ahead, Becca. Thank you for the question. I think it's a, a great and logical question. I um, I would say at this point, I'm not sure. I don't. It, it might that might be something that Ellen can address. Whether the state emergency operations plan, um, which she's been more involved in that end of things, um, might understand where food stockpiling falls into hazard mitigation and emergency operations. And I know um, <clears throat> that the mass feeding plan is going to be rewritten um, and is under way with that. Um, I, what I would anticipate, Representative, is that that will be something that is investigated in the plan and that will understand whether that is a recommendation and that's been effective in the state and in other states. Um, I think there are other forms of ensuring food availability in the category of stockpiling that have been successful. Um, you know, I've, it's been shared with me that in Rochester, the market there had an agreement, the max market had an agreement with the town. And when Irene occurred, the town in a way had an account with the max and was able to access food on the shelves without having ready money to pay for it. And they already had had that agreement established as part of their emergency preparedness. So it's another um, approach to stockpiling that's less like grain in a warehouse and more looking at like, where is, how can we use existing infrastructure for um, really rapid response? So a little bit of my answer is I'm not sure, but I do think that component will be collected into the plan and we'll know the answer at that point. Ellen, do you have any additional information? No, I mean, uh, to, thanks for bringing up the reminder to say that the that the folks that have been part of the mass feeding operation, um, we're not quite through the pandemic yet, but the, the game plan is to do that after action review of everything that they did related to mass feeding and then to update their plan. It's part of what you just do as emergency preparedness. You, 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 you learn from what you've done and then you use that learning to revise and update your plans so that when the next emergency comes, you're that much smarter and farther ahead and being able to address what's coming at you. So um, yeah, I, th I'm, I, I would imagine that this is a topic um, that will be discussed, but whether we come out with something concrete at the end, it's, it's not yet known. Well, yeah, you know, Becca, I can... I, hold on one sec, Tom. I just want to follow up if that's okay. Um, Becca, could you just say again, uh, the town of Rochester, the city of Rochester, or do you, was that Rochester, New York, or Rochester, Vermont? <laughs> oh, Vermont. Uh, so this is a, um, this is a, this will probably be the case for me as I go through this project, a sort of third hand piece of information that I received from a regional planner um, at Two Rivers, Atacuichi, who when I was, as I, we've just been investigating that town, it's municipalities are using for emergency preparedness related to food. This was an example she shared with me that Rochester, Vermont had an agreement, the town had an agreement with their max market that in the case of an emergency, the town would have access to what was on the shelves. Um, now, I can't go into any sort of, sort of enough information to be dangerous, but um, I can certainly find out more information if, um, if that would be helpful to you at this time. That, that would be fabulous. I'd love to learn more about that. And I also remember um, that during Irene, Rochester did this amazing thing where people brought food from their freezers, which were, you know, which were out of commission. And they basically brought it to the inn in town. They were preparing food and people were going there to eat, which I thought was just fantastic, you know. Uh, made so much sense. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. And, and as Helen said, uh, that works great for a couple of weeks, <laughs> like yeah, what we right. had to deal with with Irene. But when you have a pandemic that's now almost two years old, it's a whole other thing to then maintain that. It's a whole other level of preparedness that needs to be uh, addressed. A absolutely, Ellen. I just, I thought, well, Rochester, what a cool town Rochester is to come up with that idea, you know, and make it happen and feed your people for even a couple of weeks. Because a lot of us would have just said, eh, you know, what are we going to do here? 
just it, put, put all this rotten food on the compost heap and you know go on with life anyway um great uh tom go finish your thought if you well, i just had a, i just had another thought I'm, most of you are <laughs> probably too young to remember this but in the late 50s and early 60s uh, the schools i went to and our local um, um, town halls basements whatever were filled with um uh, surp I don't know if it's first surplus food, but it was uh, food for preparedness in case of nuclear war, food and water. And uh, it was all over the place. And um, and it, it made me think uh, during Irene, the day after Irene hit our town, which is hit pretty hard, uh, the National Guard was pulling up in these uh, strange vehicles, uh, tracked vehicles into our town. And they're delivering many, many th thousands of gallons of, uh, of bottled water. And we, we, we had we had places for a lot of it, but a lot of it we just didn't have place for. And uh, it had to go to another town, and it could have been used in some of the rural areas that just had no electricity to run their pumps and whatever. So this has been done before. I don't know whatever happened to all that nuclear food, uh, but uh, it seemed to work, and when I was in school. I, I don't know what was in those boxes. I, I was, I, and I don't know how, how what it was that kept all those years. I, they just... Uh, it was in the basement of my high school all the while I went to high school. So it's probably still there. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. Can't <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, John, your hand is up. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I don't know who anybody i guess can can have a shot at answering this but I, i'm just talking about food these really big subjects like food nutrition diet health care uh, made me think about some, something that didn't necessarily come up with is that it's so tied to education and and how far <clears throat> people go with their education and i was thinking of an example of if we took all our lawyers and legislative counsel uh, you know, underpaid for how amazing they are, but but all highly educated. I guarantee you there's a lot less food insecurity there than if we took, you know, 27 dropouts from, you know, people who didn't graduate from high school. Uh, and so, you know, when you start thinking about these issues, instead of just thinking about how do we feed people, you get into these huge subjects of like, how do we get people further in school? And, and where do you go with that without your heads exploding? So from the healthcare perspective, we do know that in Vermont, one of the highest risk factors for um, chronic conditions is your level of educational attainment. Uh, that, that is quite clear if you look at the CDC data on that. So you see, it ha you see repercussions throughout um, uh, your lifetime and also throughout your health span. You know, when we approach it from the perspective of how do we integrate food and food access into, in, into health, there's some amount of teasing out of how much is related to simply income, how much is related to other factors like knowledge about nutrition, knowledge about cooking. I don't think law school taught a lot of knowledge about nutrition. Frankly, medical school doesn't teach that much about nutrition, I've come to discover. <laughs> um, so, so when we talk about education components, the, there's the element of what, what life skills are the new gener are new generations learning? Um, how do they engage with food? How do they understand what constitutes a healthy diet and ways to make that fit in with their their lives, whatever it, it might be? Um, and then the questions of straight up financial barriers. You have a work schedule where you can't get off work in time to get to the emergency food location at this specific hour at this specific time, you know, those conflating factors. So, so, we, so we take it in two related chunks um, as we think about how to approach this issue. Do, do you notice then, you know, sort of generationally compared to Representative Box time to now that like people are know a lot more about sort of the education of diet and, and nutrition is it is it improving or is it, it so you know we know things, more for sure but two things have happened in the last uh generation or so um there there's 
nutrition science is a relatively young science. It progresses. Some of us remember the dark days of nutritional advice in the 1990s. We're getting past those. So there's a lot more information flowing. Unfortunately, some of it is misinformation and fad diets. So the, the ecosystem of information available on what constitutes a healthy diet and then what ties to specific health factors and risk factors is better than it was. We also have emerging areas of lifestyle medicine and culinary nutrition um, on the healthcare provider side where there's greater education in that realm as well. So, so that's the good news. The bad news is that the food environment has changed even more dramatically and the signals and the pressures towards less healthy food, highly processed food, sugar-filled food outweighs by a pretty wide margin, those uh, informational and educational gains. So um, the net effect has been disastrous <laughs> for, for the incidence of diet-related disease. Um, Thank you. Other, other questions? All right, did you, did you all have more that you wanted to add? Yeah, so you know, I think I think hopefully this goes without saying, but just you know, you all as the Agriculture and Forestry Committee, you're used to thinking about the from farm to plate, right? The the way in which food gets produced, it gets processed, it gets distributed, it gets bought, it turns into compost eventually. Like you're used to thinking of that whole supply chain of food. What the food security plan, it, plan and this action plan that we want to create is more complicated because we are showing where and we're going to be investigating those intersection points between healthcare, between education, between transportation, physically getting to a store, especially in rural communities, intersection uh, with income distribution. Uh, intersections with land use planning, like all of that is, and housing, uh, and how, where is housing in connection to basic services and, and grocery stores, for instance, all of those things intersect in like overlapping Venn diagram type in a, that, visually, right? So that's part of what makes this project unique is that we're really gonna be trying to look at all of the components that would lead to some, a, a family, a, a, an individual feeling that they were in fact food secure. And, and what are the additional policies, programs, initiatives, investments in infrastructure, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, programmatic uh, efforts to really bolster the ability of Vermonters to feel food, food secure. And that's really the point of this is to get, I, I know that oftentimes you guys are, are faced with um, requests where we're just gonna plan, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this. So we're gonna try to like, we're gonna plan to plan to plan to plan as Colleen Goodrich said last week, right? Um, that's not what this is about. There is a planning component, but the point of this is to actually be bringing all of these different domains together for the first time to really try to tackle this question of food security. And it is a long-term effort because this is systemic. It's not something that we're gonna be able to address overnight. It's probably a generational overall effort, um, but we need to start now. We have this incredible opportunity that is coming out of the pandemic where we're all much more aware of the magnitude of what we're facing and what needs to get changed. And so um, we had put in a request last September to the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets uh, requesting a one-time allocation of $150,000 to help with this development of this food security plan for the state to do this priority action that came out of the strategic plan. And the agency had been really excited about it. They put it forward in their budget uh, recommend to the, to the governor's office. Um, and unfortunately, the governor's office did not incorporate it into the governor's uh, budget that you received a few weeks ago. Um, and so I, what I want to ask for your consideration is as you're thinking about your 
I don't know if it's going to be a committee bill or just sort of what you're going to be getting behind in your request to the House Appropriations Committee that you consider uh, a request of $150,000 in one-time funding from the general fund uh, to be able to support this, this initiative. Um, we have funding that we received from the De Vermont Department of Health, uh, which they received from the CDC. Uh, as Helen mentioned, by state has come in with some funding. We've gotten some other foundation funds from the Community Foundation and a, an anonymous foundation that just sent us a check, which was great. Um, but we do have this $150,000 gap to be able to complete this project. Uh, and part of the cost is some, pr some primary research, which is what Helen's organization is gonna be funding some transportation uh, related research in how Vermonters access food. Um, but then we're also gonna be providing stipends to people with lived experience to make sure that their voices are really totally incorporated into this work. Um, and so th this will be wrapped up uh, fully by the end of 2023 and, uh, and, and we'll be getting to work on, uh, on implementing all of these uh, things that are coming out of this, this work. So uh, just wanted to put that on the table for your consideration and uh, happy to provide any documentation, Madam Chair, that might be helpful to you as you guys consider this. And, uh, and I would just encourage you to bring in you know, people like Jason Goslin, who ran the, who is the facilitator of the mass feeding group to talk, to learn more about what they're doing. And Suzanne Kelly uh, at, from Vermont Department of Health to understand what they're doing. Um, Sue Graff from the Agency of Human Services about their connection to the emergency feeding operations. There's a number of people uh, that I provided some names uh, for consideration having someone from the agency come in. This is a really an unprecedented, special one-time opportunity to do this work. John Sales and uh, from the food bank, you know, have him in to talk about this. They're all involved. Um, and uh, we have a really, uh, a great opportunity to come up with something that we can all implement, that we're all aligned around and that we're all moving forward fairly quickly uh, on, on implementing, so. I'll leave it at that, except if you have other questions. Um, so Ellen, you said that the ask is now $100,000 because you've made up the, the, the other $50,000 in other ways. No, no, the ask is 150. Okay, 150, okay. Yeah, this is more like, this is a, a, a much more than 150 ever, uh, uh, project, <laughs> especially over two years with all the complexities that are involved. Um, and so we've we've raised everything but 150. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, but it's 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 a one-time ask for 150, but it's meant to cover two years of work. Correct. Okay, thanks. Um, John, your hand is up. Go ahead. Just quickly, Becca, what what was the program Abenaki helping Abenaki? I'd never heard of that before. That's a program. Um, that it, it's run through the Abenaki um, band, I believe, went through the band that's run by Chief Stevens. I actually don't know a ton of details about it. I think if you wanted to hear about it, I would really recommend bringing the organizers in and I could let them know um, if you were interested. There's, it's, there's, um, are you familiar with the term food sovereignty? as a, a thinking about some really self-determination in terms of food access and food resources? Uh, a little bit. It was funny, Representative Yacovoni emailed a couple of weeks ago and said, what's, what's food sovereignty? Some constituent keeps pounding me about it. And I, I wrote it back partly about this program of regional food security, but then I realized there's this whole element of indigenous peoples and their food security and sovereignty. So th there are a lot of complexities there that I would love to hear more about it. Yeah, I think I would want, I can speak very briefly about it, but I would really want to be more prepared to speak eloquently to it. And, uh, you know, obviously those who are indigenous are more, would be more appropriate to speak about it more fully. Um, indigenous or our tribal groups in Vermont are, um, have very high food insecurity rates. And my understanding is that the Abenaki Helping, Helping Abenaki program is, um, 
a, a project that's really within the tribal groups where they are assisting one another in a mutual support way with food access and food production. Um, but again, I don't want to leave with leave you with only that information. Um, and I can pursue getting more details to you all if that would be helpful. I think, okay, I great. think that would be great. Becca, if you're willing to do that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I, I'm a little distracted because I've just found out my brother-in-law died. <laughs> so oh. I'm kind, of, kind of dealing with family stuff here. So I apologize to you all. Um, Very any, sorry. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, for, or anything you all want to add? All right. Well, I think, um, you know, we can have more discussion about the, um, the ask. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we're really blessed at this time to have um, quite a bit of money to work with. And it's almost like a once in a lifetime. <laughs> I, you, we keep hearing once in a lifetime, but it really is sort of once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to, to work on some of these projects that we might not ordinarily um, think about. But um, I think that um, the pandemic has certainly, as we've said a million times, revealed a bunch of cracks in our, our various uh, societal structures and um, this might be this perfect perfect opportunity to bring people together and and discuss this so we can have more more of a discussion here in committee and and see if we want to pull together a, a, a Ellen what form would it take would it be a committee bill or where we have an ask uh, uh, for this or what what do you, I mean we've also got we've got the ask for the uh, Forest future strategic roadmap we're thinking about. Um, I mean, I, I think if there is, if do you have, are there any bills related to say farm to school or universal meals or anything like that? Because if from a germane, like what would be germane there, that would be a, a closer fit perhaps of just adding a section to something like that. Mm -hmm. Linda, do you know if they're doing anything in the Senate about um, universal meals? They have not yet. Okay. All right. Well, we'll kind of keep our eyes open for for something. Oh, no, excuse me. They have had some testimony. Oh, they have. Some, they've had testimony. Well, we can see if they're if they're doing a bill. Maybe we can uh, um, send it back with a little addition. So, yeah, I, 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 it, it's really, if you're thinking that it would be helpful to have a very short, brief committee bill of like one section to just make, just to do this, we could do that. But it seems like having something that we can attach the, the request to would probably make it easier to just overall handle. Okay, we can think about that. Maybe we'll, we'll consult Michael Grady, who was our or guru, and we can also, you know, talk about whether we, as a committee, want to support this. Um, so, yeah, any other questions, comments? Um, all right, that's the mysterious opening door behind Helen. I know. <laughs> my, my cat heard that you were closing it. She came in to demand to be pet. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I had a feeling it was a cat or a dog. <laughs> uh, Tom, your hand is up. Is that a, another hand or is that legacy? Something I, came to, to, to my, into my mind. Uh, while, okay. While Helen was talking, I was, I was curious uh, when you're talking about um, a healthy food and, and, and diet and, uh, and health. Um, is the problem, I don't want to say if it's a problem, yes, it is a problem, of um, unhealthy foods uh, in, in certain ethnic groups. For example, uh, it, it is, uh, if you go into um, uh, uh, Mexican um, um, supermarkets in, in the Southwest, in California and Arizona and Texas, you, you find 
huge containers of manteca, lard, and they're being used uh, in, in their diet, and they're not changing. And then you, you, you find uh, the, uh, in my neck of the woods, where I came from, lutefisk, which is, to me, was uh, salt and butter and cream. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. That's what, and, we, that and, and, and I think some of the, the healthier um, cooks of lutefisk added uh, big slabs of bacon. And, uh, <laughs> and, I don't know and, what that and is. Then there's, there's, there's a whole series of African American foods, uh, ribs, etc., that that um, cannot include. Is, are these kinds of things? Are these an issues uh, issues that you're going to have to address uh, in Vermont, or is it, don't you see it here as a problem? Those ethnic uh, preferences. Yeah, I. So you have gone to a, a important conversation in uh, nutrition and, and nutritional counseling. So the, the overall answer, and I should say I'm not a registered dietitian, but the overall answer is that the dominant eating patterns that lead to poor health outcomes are sugar-sweetened beverages and highly processed, highly refined foods. So though I, I, I don't want to to throw modern food industry under the bus uh, too aggressively uh, because it has provided many convenient things, uh, but that is generally speaking the problem. So anything that is based more or less on whole ingredients and eating in moderation and not drinking your calories is going to be an improvement and any traditional eating pattern will fall into that category. So there's programs like the Old Ways Food Network um, in out of the Massachusetts area that's basically saying, take it back a couple of generations, <laughs> you know, and, and I realize that there are good reasons related to how we live our lives that we want to <laughs> not have to make everything from scratch, but at the same time, there needs to be a balance there. So that's the overall nutrition pattern answer. It's not based on cuisine type as much as it is on um, that question of whole ingredients and sugar sweetened products and eating the occasional vegetable. Thank you. All right. I uh, love your cat, Helen, very cute. <laughs> uh, um, uh, John, go ahead. You know, just something I thought of with, with Tom's question, it was, was the United States did, was our diet much healthier in in you know pre pre depression than it is now? I mean, a lot less range of foods, but um, a lot less processed and sugar drinks too. I, I don't want to take uh, answering away from Ellen and Becca. It it was problematic for different reasons. So you know that's why we see the food assistance programs that we have today coming out of. Um, the world wars is that there was insufficient food uh, and and we we saw it and and now it's reversed right so now now it's too much too low quality food so we had different problems then all right um any other questions for ellen becca or helen I am not seeing any. Um, so we really appreciate you taking time today to spend with us. And, uh, and I look forward to working on this. I think it's an important issue as we want to keep our Vermonters fed and hopefully with more nutritious local food. And um, so we really appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts with us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, take care. All right, <clears throat> committee. Mm -hmm. um, you want to take a break so you can call your sister or whatever um, you need to do? No, I think I'm good.